Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. I have the pleasure to introduce uh, our guest lecturer, Jia. Uh, she's based in Berlin. She's originally from Beijing. And we are very pleased to have her here. We know that China is one of the really driving and very kind of powerful forces. They have many, many building sites. There's a lot of innovation going on. And uh, so most of Chinese contemporary architecture is influenced or conditioned or derived from Western models. Now a lot of Western architects either try to work in China or try starting imitating what's happening in China or looks into Chinese models kind of assuming that we kind of lagging behind and that we have to catch up. What I find very interesting in uh, Jazz uh, example or Jazz kind of work and teaching and uh, writing is this kind of idea of between cultures. She speaks about living in Berlin and not using her Chinese language as much as she would like, and also learning, being away from China, learning to understand China much better and feeling more Chinese by being out of China. On the other hand, when she goes back to China, feeling a little bit detached and not really finding her place anymore. So this kind of situation, many people in, in some way like cultural refugees or exilees or expatriates, which many people, even if they don't move out of their country, start to experience. So even moving from one city to another or kind of start moving from one generation or from one school to another, kind of starting this kind of very strange experience of kind of um, in some way estrangement or of recovery of a lost knowledge or lost memory or kind of understanding things which were kind of not very clear. What I found also so interesting uh, in uh, Ja is that she left architecture to do something I think different, which I think follows up in some way on a larger cultural aspiration. Uh, so she kind of is an artist, does installations, she's very interested in calli calligraphy, which I, I think is very fundamental to her work, uh, as it kind of has this both an abstract intellectual symbolic dimension, but it has also the figural, pictorial, and uh, I think spiritual dimension, which kind of in some way in architecture we also uh, struggle with and aspire to. <coughs> Uh, she has been uh, doing very successful exhibition. Actually, she's going to New York now. She has uh, ex exhibitions in South America, in Europe, a group exhibition, also individual exhibition. She published actually a very wonderful book on Chinese landscape architecture, which is now uh, in the process of being translated into English. She worked with uh, quite famous artists. She was uh, a public relation um, um, manager for YY, who's probably uh, somebody you are familiar with, he was one of the most uh, prestigious artists involved in the in the building of the Olympic, in the poly in Olympic architecture. He was actually co-designing the nest with Herzog de Meuron and got also some fame because afterwards he got under problems uh, because he was very outspoken and so, so a very interesting person who is now a visiting professor also in Berlin and uh, got uh, in trouble getting a visa for the United Kingdom, as you might have heard about. Now, let me just kind of uh, read from some of um, her very beautiful writing, uh, which you can actually download from, from uh, I mean, she has some articles in Huffington Post, and there is some really interesting other writing you can download. The first thing, in, in some way, my reason actually to suggest uh, we invite Ja was she wrote an architect, arch article uh, in the Huffington Post, I think, which is called uh, Xi Jinping has had enough of weird architecture and so have I. <laughs> so writing, you know, the most important, so I don't know if that's prime minister, Chinese prime minister or the one of the most important leaders of China just kind of being fed up with what was happening and just said, you know, that's enough. And also saying fine arts, fine artworks should be like sunshine from a blue sky 
and breathe in the spring that will inspire minds, warm hearts, cultivate taste, and clean, clean up undesirable work styles. And that's something he said in October 14th, 2014. So really trying to bring fresh inspiration into Chinese architecture. One other quote from her writing, which I find very interesting, and it goes so much against what we often assume. We assume that globalization is this kind of terrible thing which happens all over the world, that it's kind of completed. And it's very interesting that, that there are many people kind of really looking at it very differently. And I found it very surprising when I read through her biographical notes that she as a student have, has actually not seen very much of the modern architecture which was built in China, which we were very familiar with maybe in America and in Europe, where Chinese students had apparently to struggle to even fight literature. So they were kind of craving for Western modernism, but they couldn't see it live in situ, but they, and they had very limited information on it. So what she talks about architecture, and I think this explains also maybe some of the orientation and some of the maybe fantasies of Chinese architecture, she said, for us, and she speaks about the architecture students, for us, modern architecture was in many respects imaginary. So it's a part of a kind of imagination, of a, of a kind of really beautiful projection, which they kind of haven't really seen or experienced completely. And maybe the hangover is coming or it's maybe coming. Uh, now, also, she also says, China self-inflicted cultural destruction, and she mentions that by 2005, less than 10% of the historical stock of architecture survived, I don't know if it's in China or Beijing, in Beijing. So only less than 10% survived, and then with the Olympic construction, even the less than 10% were diminished, so there was more and more destruction going on. So, self-inflicted cultural destruction, frenzy and despair, combined with increased idealistic workshop of the West, has yielded a strange state of affairs. And following later, she said, bulldozers not only demolish traditional buildings, but were the essence, uh, that were the essence of much of our history, but they also demolished much of the harmony, contentment and optimism that, way it, that we inherited from traditional Chinese thought. And so, oh yeah, so uh, I, I was talking about global, so a last kind of quote, global strategist Pankaj Gem, Gemavat published World 3.0, a book on how limited globalization really is. This condition may have its benefits. I learned that the inhabitants of my adopted city, Berlin, know very little about China, but they have plenty of curiosity. Being asked all the time about China by my friends and living 7,000 kilometers distance from Beijing makes me think of my home country all the time. James Joyce lived most of his adult life in Trieste, Zurich, and Paris but he only wrote about an Ireland he could neither escape or forget. Nostalgia is an eternal theme in literature and art. When I think about China, from the vantage point of Middle Europa, where I have no personal mm -hmm. history, looking back helps me to understand better the gap between traditional Chinese civilization and the tsunami of Western trends that has swept over China. On the one hand, Chinese have been excited and curious about new emphasis from the West, but since we are struggling to find our way through these cultural connections and differences, we often get lost and abandon our own culture, and so on and so on. So uh, let me just um, conclude by also mentioning that Jia has studied cinema, publishing. She has a master's in traditional opera, uh, history of opera. And I think she has a really, really well-rounded and very complex uh, kind of profile, which I think will allow her to really give us a very sophisticated presentation of 
Chinese contemporary architecture and kind of what we can learn from it and what we kind of shouldn't learn from it. Let me conclude by thanking the, all the organizations uh, who and people who make this um, this conference, uh, this lecture possible. So I like to first thank, uh, of course, the School of Architecture for their incredible uh, uh, lecture series. I'd like to add uh, my colleague Sami Yunus, who chaired the lecture committee. I like to thank the Snipe Museum, who not offered only graciously the lecture hall here, but also contributed and sponsored the lecture. I'd like to uh, thank the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies. And I also like to thank the Institute for Eastern Asian Languages and Literature, who also uh, sponsored. I would also like to invite you, for people who are interested, uh, the Student Association for Women in Architecture. They have organized a very, I think, interesting conversation, discussion tomorrow at Bond Hall in our gallery space, and where Ja will not only speak about her career as an architect, but she will kind of more uh, comprehensively also present her artwork. Please join me in uh, wel welcoming Ja, uh, our tonight's lecture. Thank you. So, um, dear O, thank you for giving me this chance to share some of my thoughts and my feelings about contemporary Chinese architecture with you. Why am I going to tell you some stories here? When it comes to design concept, you can find plenty of this in reference books or architecture magazines or in other architects' lectures. I don't need to repeat them here, but my own experience in Chinese architectural world and my friend's experience may give you another view of what has been happening in China that you cannot read um, in the books or on other media. I hope it opens another window for, for you on China. Before I started to share some stories with you, I'd like to brief, briefly review the Chinese traditional architecture, even though it's usually not the resource of contemporary Chinese architecture. I think to spend five minutes to look back may help us to understand what's going on and how to look into the future. As you may know, the traditional Chinese buildings were mostly made by wood. This is a building um, we call the Nanchan Temple. It's uh, built uh, about 782 BC and from Tang Dynasty. That's a very um, few traditional Chinese um, architecture still existing from that period. And probably if you know the Chinese history, the Tang Dynasty is a glorious uh, um, period in, in traditional Chinese history, the architecture, the culture, and the poems, and also the empire. So just the opposite of traditional Western architecture may, you know, the opposite of traditional uh, Western architecture made by wood. So for Chinese, to coral or mine stone was in science to violate the natural uh, landscape. But the use of wood, which was re renewable, was a material that for the Chinese seemed more like continuance rather than violation of natural order. That's the uh, um, whole of uh, um, superior ha harmony that's um, in the in Beijing that's uh, the structure of the old traditional Chinese building. To save the good woods and to wait for the good craftsmen, that's how the Chinese took the first step to build a house, from stickling a tree all the way to the constructing a space where one could live and work as a long process of hope. It was the father's generation to plant the tree in order to have the son or grandson's house built on time. With its roots remain, the regrowth of a cut tree will be unavoidable. And with its source remain, 
the res restoration of abstracted water will be unavoidable. With this space remain, a disaster which has temporarily disappeared will truly reappear. This quotation is from 5th century BC to tell people what we learn from the tree and how we use this knowledge to create livable habitat for humans. But the wood structure is just a general concept. In each different area, the local architecture was quite distinctive. But there was a force to gather all this local architecture as a Chinese architecture. That force was the Chinese language. Western language are, om are most often divided from Latin or Roman script. Let's later, let's let's later involved into separated languages. The result was that adjacent area was divided in different countries because of the language differences. But the Chinese language, which is a language based on the Han Dynasty, um, a Han nationality language and culture, was like a super enhancer that put broken pieces back together. History has its own enhancer, biocracy and a united language. The Chinese language is a biocracy and Bureaucratic and um, administration brought different regions and cultures and even minorities into a precarious union. <coughs> Asian China didn't treat architecture as an art um, <coughs> deliberately. Deliberation means consciousness intention. It maintains artif um, artificial elements. The Chinese character of artificial or fake is a compass of two characters, man plus make. So man-made is artificial or fake. In another word, it's not quite right. From that theory, architecture was born between man-made and nature being be de developed in such a way that humanity becomes an integral part of nature. From this idea, the traditional Chinese architecture acquired some special features. The tendon joint, this is the tendon joint, the tendon joint structure in which all the wood parts are joined by a special design without nails. The more pressure, the more stable the structure. The, the old maxim was falls down, but the structure remains. It's a way to describe how stable the wood structure remains after an earthquake. With age, the wood will be loosened, but because of the chief, uh, because of all parts connection lead to in different directions, the stress achieve a new balance to make it as stable as before. The standard of modular construction was established from 1093 BC. And this is the book from uh, 1097 from the Song Dynasty, and here is a copy of, of this, how, how it's structured. And horizontal instead of vertical extension of architecture allow this 720,000 square meters forbidden city, this is the overview of Forbidden City, to be built within 14 years. 300,000 people were working at the same time, it saved on material, it was on budget. Modular unions not only were prefabricated, but also could be moved and reused on different buildings and in different places. All the buildings were being built at the same time. So all the parts could be replaced and re re renovated. If the bigger parts suffered wear and tear, they could be cut into smaller parts in order to be re reused. Besides that, there are some other unique characters of traditional Chinese architecture. For example, we look back. This is the flying rafter brackets, are both functional and also decorative. 
But this time we're not going to focus on the tradition, but on the contemporary. So now let's see how it's developed. In fact, there was no gradual development. Every aspect of traditional Chinese culture, including the lang traditional language, performance such as opera, painting styles, and architecture, all ended with Chi Chinese empire. I remember in, in our history class from primary school, we were often taught that powerful Western military attract, exploded the closed door policy of Qing dynasty, the last empire of China. With the entrance of Western culture, the first international sh uh, city, Shanghai, celebrated its glorious day during the 1930s. This is a poster from, from the 1930s of Shanghai. And there arrived many experimentals with the combination of Chinese and Western architecture style. A good example is uh, Sun Yansen's muslin in, in, in Nanjing. This is uh, Sun Yansen's muslin in Nanjing. And Sun was the first president and founder, fa founding father of Republic of China. So his muslin was designed by the Chinese architect Lu Yanzhi at the age of 28. Some examples were designed by Western architects like this. This is the um, Beiping Public Library designed by Molov um, in 1930s. This delicacy with the um, ad advance of the World War II. So shortly after the People's Republic of China was established in 1949, socialist realism architecture based on the Soviet model became dominant style of public building. The most famous were the so-called 10 great buildings to commemorate the 10th anniversary of founding of People's Republic. You may have heard of Yong Hechang, who was the head of the Department of Architecture um, at MIT several years ago. His father was the architect who participated in this 10 great buildings program. That is one of the great hall of people that um, his father public, um, participated. And when the Cultural Revolution started in 1965, construction in the whole country were stopped over 10 years. And after reforming and opening policy of Deng Xiaoping began in the 80s, there were another 10, 10 great um, buildings were being built in Beijing. And this is one of them is Beijing International Hotel being built in 1987. And then in the 90s, again, another 10 great buildings. And this is the uh, Xindongan Plaza being built at, uh, finished at 1997. So in that two decades, there were almost no Western architects involved. During that period, you could see that besides uh, imitating Western modern architecture style, the Chinese architects tried to impose traditional Chinese elements. There were lots of criticism of tendency to add Chinese roof to Western buildings when I was at the university in, in this late 90s. Then the influx of Western architects had their glory days in the end of at the late, late of 90s and the beginning of 20, 21 centuries. But unfortunately, you miss it. It started with Jean Nouvel's Grand Opera House. And after lots of um, oppositions, but when supposed by the leaders from central government, this tendency gave rise to many other projects, especially with the coming of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Conservatives began to call China a testing ground for the Western contemporary architecture. Although I'm not going to tell you that how Herbert Domron won the National Stadium contact, I was working at Iwewe Studio at the beginning of 2013. Herbert Domron was introduced by Uli Sik, one of the most influen influential contemporary Chinese um, art collectors, to Weiwei. So the 
the current leader at that time, Chairman Hu Jintao, knew uh, Weiwei personally. For Weiwei's father was a very famous uh, communist part, party point. So Weiwei had chance to represent her the most design to Hu. I was there when he prepared the presentation. I mean, unfortunately, I, I didn't thought about to take some pictures, so I couldn't show you the pictures at that time. But in the flea market, that's um, antique market, that way we had found a big bunch of thread from the majority um, culture, um, area. It wasn't on a spindle or in a ball. It was a traditional way of binding thread and to make it lots of skill to master. And the result looked exactly, oh, sorry. Look exactly like the bird nest. You see this kind of like thread. And um, most people, they probably don't know it. So, and, um, but in just in a, a smaller size, it has been part of the uh, right uh, wedding dowry in the old days. It means the couple's relationship in their marriage could last forever like this endless thread. We can't deny the friendship or the access of Weiwei to the chi Chinese head of state was helpful to realize this project. Perhaps equally important was the architect's desire to find inspiration in Chinese culture and devise a mess to forge a relationship between the design and traditional culture. When Zaha Hadid, this is not Zaha Hadid's uh, project, but when Zaha Hadid got her first project from Soho, China, one of the biggest Chinese real, real estate developers in 2003, her student, Yan Song Ma, was working along with Japanese architect Yusuke Hayano at her London office. Those two were went to Beijing to start working on the project. But soon after, Soho, China had financial troubles and did not go ahead with the project. So the two young art architects had no chance to go back to London to work with Zaha again. Since Zaha wasn't sure if he could get another project in China. So they opened their own studio called MAD. I was also there at the beginning and facing all the difficulties with them. To have the first media coverage wasn't that difficult at that time. There were very few architecture studios in China. Most of Chinese architects at that time were still working in the state's architecture companies with hundreds of architects and engineers working together. So MAD was very lucky to be one of the forerunners that all the trendy and cultural magazines were looking for. MAD became famous in very short time, but still in the first three years, although lots of people knew their design, and they won some competitions. They did not manage to get any real projects. The studio went almost bankrupt when Qundang joined and became a an partner. And her husband was a banker and provided a law to MAD, so MAD survived. When it came to MAD's first real project, the clients knew it was the first, so he negotiated hard on the design fee and keep it very low. But despite this, the project ended with the bankruptcy of the clients. This is a real project they finished in 2002 in Canada. It's called Absolute Towers. It's a residential um, project. Each building is uh, around 40,000 square meters. So you may know more this kind of stories than I do. You may have to face similar difficulties one day yourself. But the main point is still design. I don't want to make any comments on their design, but the most of the concepts were created at Yale when Ma was studying with Zaha. So you could see, if you know his design, you could see some influence from her. After that, there were little time for him to continue working on design um, aspect of the enterprise. So some young architects in his office even resigned. They reasoned that because of there's no consideration of function, but only of form, they couldn't learn anything. And how often did a form have to survive in the, this 
atmosphere that it was commonplace for architecture competition to be tainted with scandal. On the objects, um, on the subject of uh, survival strategy, I was working at the Beijing office of a German firm called KSP, in charge of the strategy of, uh, it's also one of the biggest German um, studio uh, offices, um, company in Germany. So in charge of strategy of our office and marketing in China. This analyst dinners with clients and potential clients holding events regularly and uh, countering the press was my routine. Then I, I ran the whole office with another 20 architects in Beijing before I moved to Germany. During these days, I managed to participate along with so many others in seeing China take its first tentative step on, on the way towards a new architecture. This is the view of Beijing, and you see here is CCTV, and this is the new um, World Trade Center. But China is not only Beijing, and this is also China, the countryside. After the city was occupied by contemporary um, architecture, rural development become new topic for Chinese architects, and with the typical Chinese speed. Lots of Chinese rural areas have been built up like this. This is a village that happened to be in the northwest, but it doesn't matter, most of them look the same. And this is also China. The picture from my architect's friends. When they visit the place first time, they were shocked to find there were still some places like that around. The old broken houses were empty and there were no furniture, no accessories, only some potatoes on the ground. The local people don't speak Mandarin. Their local dialect is far from standard Chinese. Difficulties of communication marginalize the whole area. Besides, and that is close to the Golden Triangle, one of the China's two main opium producing area. As marginalized the people, they can't find normal jobs without speaking the Chinese. Very often the young people move to the city and fall into life of drug trafficking. AIDS often many of the children. Once the governor of Sichuan, because this is the village of Sichuan, so once the governor of Sichuan himself visits the, visits the village, he couldn't believe what he saw either. He and other governors impl implement the new village planning like other rural area, like what we saw this kind of building, and use the same building there, but this Monuments, geography, and climbs are not fit for the building designed for the plains. Soon after, the new building were destroyed by storms. So the Women and Children Development Center were willing to help children. My architect's friends, my architect's friends, Ava A. Arch, heard about this and came to help build the new local school. This is their design. And beside the school, um, I show you some. Yeah, that's this um, this uh, classroom, and this is on the process. So beside the school design, they instead uh, they help the some traditional architecture scholars. And that's the old. This is the old traditional building, and but of course this is from the leader of the. The village, you know, that's um, that's not the poor um, people there. So, with their help, the new design compromises the real local building with the local material. Here is the new design, and um, you see how they use the local material, and this and this is uh, the new design. And here is the whole village. And this is uh, a sample of a union. Mm -hmm. So besides that, they're also working on how to develop the local agriculture and economy. 
this may not be the um, commercial role of architects, but it offers hope to the whole region. With the limited budget, the construction of school was forced to start. So they forged links with QQ, a huge online social network in China, to raise money to finish the project. That is the story I most wanted to tell. Being architects to help the local people and become involved in development of rural area for me is more important than chasing formal innovation. That is why when, when our chairman Xi lectured mentioned there's enough weird architecture, I disagree with his general outlook, but all the same, I recognize that architects sh should reflect on the social benefit of their work and what they should really do and what kind of design we need today. As our star Parvins had said on TED Talk, the uncomfortable fact is that actually almost everything that we call architecture today is actually the business of design for about the richest 1% of the world's population. And this always has been. The reason why we forgot this is because this time in the history when architecture did the most transform society was those times where actually the 1% would build on behalf of 99% for various and uh, different reasons whether that was through the, the 19th century's um, philosophy or the com communism in the early 20th centuries or the welfare states or most recently of course through this in influence real estate bubble. And all of these bombs in their own various way and now take its bucket and wait back in the situation where the smartest designers and architects in the world are only really able to work for 1% of the population. As some of you may like to be an architect one day, think about whom you would like to work for and what would you really like to do for the others? This is really ought to be the first question about the direction of one's career. This is another project done by a, a arch studio, the post earthquake reconstruction in Sichuan. It's, um, it was supported by the China Foundation for Poverty Alivation so this project, including the village hall, and uh, this is the village hall, and this is an um, um, agriculture cooperative society. So the architects study the local building feature and continue the local architect. This is um, the like the old, old local architectures, um, half indoors and half outdoors design and the pinched roof. So the two forms, the two buildings form a L shape and to define the public enclosed space. They remain almost everything, including the trees, the pools, the pool and the surrounding buildings. This village hall merged into the environment. And drinking tea is a favorite pastime in Sichuan. So this village hall, the activity center, gives local people a place to gather tea, creating the space, a sense of communicate that has been lost. I don't know, probably you heard about in 2008, the, this uh, um, big earthquake in Sichuan. So that's the project. That's how the children use the space and to study. So another story I want to tell here is that another architect, Wang Xin, he thinks of also this new village plan, just a silly rule from the top down rather than a real urban plan. Frankly, it was a disaster for countryside to destroy the local style and the features. As an architect, to bring back design to the local people and let them decide it, what 
they should build individually. It's a way to create a wide, uh, a wide variety of resource for design. He is trying with his the sh the shadow of pine tea gardens, pine tea gardens, to bring the vitality for the future development of countryside. This side is uh, is um, a yard in a um, mid school teacher's house. It's only seven meter by eight meters. So two sides a ho uh, house and two sides a wall. So you see on this are the houses and this side is a wall. Here is the entrance. <coughs> so once in design that's two meters by four meters building on one side, it's more like an object than a building. The whole side was divided in two parts outside on Chinese tea garden and inside the Japanese tea ceremony. This is the Japanese tea ceremony. This is the Chinese tea garden. The, ex the exterior Chinese tea garden is more like a party space. The architect was inspired by the traditional Chinese painting. Let's work with, so this is a traditional Chinese painting. Hui Shan Tea Gathering and which have several intellectuals gathering under the pines and enjoy tea and talking. Wangxin planned to have five pie trees in the garden and named the projects the Shadows of Pie Trees Tea Garden. Here's the pie trees. In the transition between the outdoor tea garden and indoor tea house, there are several stairs. There are several stairs and also uh, work for seating. So step on stairs and space become narrow and smaller. And through you entering a cave, the door is only one meter fifty high. So you have to crawl into it, like the traditional Chinese uh, Japanese space. When you sit down, you feel differently in the space than you could feel standing up. Through touching the space, everything scales the size between the furniture and building in order to see the bigger things through the smaller ones. You hear, you, you hear the sounds of water coming through the corner, open the window where the painting's leaves are. You will see the water from the mountain drops into the tea garden as the fountain flows through the tea table. Another size of the window can be removable as well. So each size represents a view like a picture a lamp in the corner, pine trees, and so on. The house is situated obliquely like, uh, on the side, like a boy in the old Chinese poem, side sideways on moles and slewed it against the green grass. The entrance and exit refers to a Japanese tea ceremony. This stealth, this stealth and Symbolic demands make you feel that you are in the theater side or become an actor or actress because your movements are very close and related to space. Although the outdoor and indoor represent two different ways of drinking tea, but the architects doesn't treat it as different between the culture of two countries. He thinks it's only a question of time. Since the Japanese culture was strongly influenced by Chinese culture, 1,400 years ago, and the two spaces form a dialogue. To drink tea is such a space will give us a counter view of the relationship between the people and the environment. When we imagine how our ancestors used to enjoy tea, another kind of profound feeling arises from the virtue of history memory. Conflicts are bound to arise from the different different culture background of the architect and clients. From the beginning, the clients didn't want to lose his 10 years old tree in the middle of the site. He asked the architect to add the path of ropes he had collected. The architects always offered a better solution without losing the sense of the original design. So the whole process became unexpectedly pleasant. I was curious how the original teacher without fortune and from the countries, uh, from a countryside decided to hire an architect to design a tea house and a garden. 
to find out the reason, we have to look back um, the architect's an antique tea set collection. One of Wang Xin's students continues his study in Japan. He wants to have a part-time job to support his study. So Wang Xin suggests that he import Japanese antique tea sets as a business. The student become very interested in tea ceremony culture and build a, fo a fo following. After a year and a half, besides his expenses, he saved some money. He want to use this money to build a tea house for his father in the countryside. In that way, his father become the client in our story. One day of the groundbreaking, once he mentioned this tea garden as the dream gift of a son to his intellectual father. The teacher, the clients of this project, couldn't hold back his tears. From the early time, the traditional Chinese garden were an intellectual ideal. It materialized the dream in your heart and has nothing to do with the reality. That is why the old garden in Suzhou didn't relate it to the urban environment. Once you enter, you forget the outside world. It is how the garden owner kept their distance from the outside world. The design of Japanese tea house derived from a similar wish. Although it's small, it's not like a snail shell that encloses, it's open you another world. Like all the traditional Chinese garden, the shadows the sh of pine trees, tea garden is also very small, maybe even smaller. But from this small point, the architects set a big example for all of us. He tried to create a new possibility for human relationships. It's it, his aspiration in that through design, we may add dignity to people's lives by knowing their highest impulse. I'm afraid I have to end my stories of contemporary Chinese architecture here. But the contemporary Chinese architect continues in his own way. I heard that you're going to have your summer school in China next year. So welcome to China and experience your own stories. Thank you. Yeah, if there are any um, questions, please let me know. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, how do you see the uh, uh, tradition informing, potentially informing contemporary Chinese uh, architecture uh, and urbanism as well? There's some examples, I think, that you've seen in our travels I think for that question, we have to look back of uh, um, the whole uh, cultural background. If people, I think especially now, and uh, um, most of uh, Chinese and more and more Chinese, they really look back of their traditional culture, so that's also effect in the architectural world. Thinking very near future, and also the example I gave that you see the young architects more focus on the um, local architecture and study the feature of of them and try to inherit it from our traditional culture. Even it's not Han nation nationality culture, but it's still Chinese culture. So from there, it's also the reason I'm giving this lecture today. I, I do see some hopes. So I'm very happy with that. Although there's, I have to say, there's lots of mistakes that the Chinese architects has made or, or even from the, from the um, leaders made that it's cannot um, backwards. 
but somehow that's I think there may be some hope in the future. Please. Yes, um, I would like to yes. ask about the uh, there is no possibility of doing architecture without uh, the building materials. And therefore, uh, I, I was wondering how uh, is uh, advancing the uh, <coughs> production of the building materials is it the building materials becoming uh, to meet the international standards or are you developing traditional building materials that you can use either to restore remaining buildings or even to uh, that could be used in new architecture Oh, I think that depends on the scale of, of the architecture and also depends on the purpose of the architecture. Of course, for the local um, architecture, like the royal architecture, and um, I hope it will be, they'll use more local material than the standard international, you know, standard material, like what we use here in America and in Europe. But uh, in general, for the big, um, architecture design, especially in the cities and especially by the Western architects. I think it has to be used by the by the standard material and even lots of material import from um, other countries. So there's also a big problem in China that's uh, the budget of, uh, of uh, um, construction get very, very high in the f within few years because of the amounts of huge demands of the material. Please. Uh, I come from a country where we had a lot of history, Italy, uh, but we've lost uh, most of our traditional techniques because we don't have uh, craftsmen who are able to restore those techniques and materialization techniques. Uh, what's the state of our craftsmen? Um, I think that's that's the same situation probably maybe even worse than Italy because um, we have very few uh, maintains and also I can tell you another story that even during the 50s that's very close to to the and of the Qing um, Empire that's uh, in for, for the Forbidden City and the corner building that's um, the roof of the corner building that's we put it down and in, in order to, to to bring it back but even that's um, just that action we did and there's a plenty of part we couldn't put it back anymore and even we have the whole plans and and still we cannot do it there's a um, you know, there's a lot of loss in in the whole culture and uh, also in the architectural world. Please. Um, you, you, you mentioned this quote, uh, there's a lot of great architecture. And, uh, and also, you were writing also uh, about the influence of Western, <laughs> so that there, there was this import from Western modernism, which uh, was the it's taught in the schools with people like Craig and Koch. How, how is China now today handling this idea of expressing an identity, a cultural identity through architecture? Are they kind of happy with what Sahari <coughs> and Duval and Kolas and Captain Noah bring to China? Are they kind of identifying with it? Or <coughs> is it just like, a, is it just accepted that architecture and cultural identity are no longer synchronic, are they no longer interact? I think uh, it's kind of like impossible that the culture and architecture no longer interact. They, they interact all the time. But of course, you know, of course, of Chairman Xi that he doesn't like all this uh, Western contemporary design. Uh, but the thing is, after his speech, and Zaha Hadid still got the new uh, airport design. <laughs> so I really don't know what happened. But, but the design is, is quite 
um, conservative compared with other her designs. So, um, but somehow that's, um, you know, China is that big, even in the small um, region, we cannot get the, everyone on the same opinion. So everyone has their different opinion. For example, a lot of young people like my generation or younger generation, they got so much influence of American culture, I have to say, that they do prefer, you know, this American style instead of Chinese style. But that's, you know, I cannot persuade them to look back at our own culture. So in that way, that's the American culture is very, very strong there. Uh, please. Mm -hmm. So, um, talking about the future and the past, what do you think, which part of the uh, traditional Chinese architectural philosophy is uh, useful and can be applied to the future architecture of China? I think, for example, the renewable ideas, you know, Chinese, traditional Chinese architecture was, I think, um, probably, uh, you know, one of uh, the most uh, green architecture in the old days. And this, if we can inherit it from that, and they may be a big help, but the problem is we don't have uh, so much wood as we had before. So it will be very hard, but there's still a lot of uh, things we can learn. But that really depends on how deep deeply we studied. It's also like the traditional Chinese medicine. You know, I think we still lack of uh, the study of the traditional, in general, all the traditional culture. So if we do put more efforts on that, I think we can get better results. Uh, please. Um, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about when you were in university, like your professors would be searching for like using like a modern like what is the design and then just putting like a Chinese roof over it. So I just wanted to ask you, because this is the case right now, do the Chinese professors encourage the architecture students in China to refrain from using Chinese aspects from architecture design or do they encourage them to? I think this is not the point now anymore, but uh, uh... I think it's divided now. So some Chinese professors, they're really uh, interested in the traditional uh, Chinese architecture. So they really uh, go deeply in studied uh, research of traditional Chinese architecture. From that, you know, they don't do strongly mixed um, design anymore. It's more totally back to the traditional. So. That's very good. And also I showed some example around 30s, you know, that's design is not bad at all. So, but simply put the roof, I think that's also because just after the cultural revolution, you know, we need some time to really uh, get the more results from, from our own culture and also from Western culture. So it takes some time and now it's getting better. Any other questions? Please. Um, you talked a little bit about um, architectural projects to rebuild after the earthquake, for mm -hmm. example, in Sichuan, and to um, you know to benefit to benefit the people who who normally don't have lots of money or things mm -hmm. like that. Do you think that the, um, for example, since the 2008 earthquakes and other earthquakes, do you think that the rebuilding process since that time has uh, successfully um, rebuilt in a way that would make will make those towns and buildings safer. And is there more generally a movement among Chinese architects to create projects that do benefit the vulnerable populations? Um, you know, the, the example I, I gave it to you, of course, is a good example. But to be honest, of course, there's also bad examples. And so it's very hard to say that um, which percent and those kind of examples are. But I do hope, you know, there will be uh, more architects like um, the architects I introduced really focus on the 
on the um, local architecture and uh, to to really work for the local people. That's also very hard because, um, to be honest, uh, I mean China. I, I shouldn't say that, but but China is has been famous on the corruption. So it's with this royal um, architecture development, and uh, of course there are some officials also want to get benefit, but. Um, you know, with a strongly, very strict uh, um, rule now, probably it's getting better. <laughs> Any other questions? Please. Uh, does China have uh, new buildings uh, built with traditional architecture in the past 10 years, or they are just building uh, with glass and steel? For the small scale, there are plenty uh, um, architecture built in traditional ways, and some architecture even totally use the traditional material. Even it's very hard, but you know some private uh, clients they can offer it, so they did build. And some new uh, designs, and even design not by the architects, but they are very good design. Please. Yes. <clears throat> I think it depends on the uh, scale of uh, the city and the rural area now, because more and more people move to the city, and now even the small small cities in China, they they try to look also international in way, and uh, and also that's kind of reasons. I have to say that, for example, some rich Chinese they like this luxury brand because they, I have to say, we were very poor before. And uh, that's one I work with, uh, Weiwei, and he mentioned that's uh, probably very few idea. I totally agree with him. And he said American, they never um, care about this luxury brand because they don't need it to show off. So probably, you know, we have to in, in order to show that China is a very strong country now. And that's why we brought all this international um, architects into China. But it, it did work in some way, but somehow it's also another destruction of uh, traditional culture. But since, you know, more and more Chinese move from royal area to city, so it's a very huge amount of percent occupied by this international architecture. But the radical aid in the royal area, you also can see some place still like that. Other questions? Okay, so thank you very much.